Warning, this video features footage of spastic lights and visuals. If you suffer from photosensitive epilepsy or have a history of visually triggered seizures, I would watch this video with extreme caution. I have done my best to edit with this in mind, but I cannot promise anything as some of the most important scenes are literally sensory overload. I know that seizure warnings are kind of the norm nowadays for video games, but I'm being 100% serious about it if you decide to watch this video, and especially if you decide to play this game. Out in the endless realm of space stands a small station by the name Lun Infinis. The station's mission is simple, run simulations for the possibility of future human habitation. These simulations would be carried out by five machines developed by the top scientists at the time, and the station itself would receive supplies and communications from Earth. But that contact stopped 30 years ago, and the simulations were only planned to run for five years. With this unplanned continued timeline, the simulations have gotten further and further away from their original mission. On top of that, a mysterious virus has appeared and is robbing the simulations of their resources, causing a panic over available CPU processing power. The Desolate Hope is a game made by Scott Cawthon before Smash Hit Five Nights at Freddy's catapulted him to stardom. While I am far too big of a baby to play a game with never-ending jump scares, I was extremely interested in Cawthon's artistic design. Luckily for me and my frayed nerves, the Desolate Hope contains what could soon be considered Cawthon's signature art style. The game stars you as a somewhat combination of characters, Coffee and Deco9. Coffee was originally a service bot for the eventual humans, but became the maintenance bot for Elon Infinis, and he employs DECO-9, the ninth alliteration of a digital counterpart used for antivirus, to assist him in taking care of the virus problem within the simulations. These simulations are run by sentient supercomputers, known as derelicts. The game is split up into two phases, the day phase, where you can enter the derelict simulation and battle against the virus, and the night phase, where the simulation shuts down and you search outside Elon Infinis for mementos for each derelict. The day phase is even further split up into three different types of gameplay segments. Platforming, dungeon crawling, and JRPG battles. The multiple gameplay mechanics are of the most unique aspects of The Desolate Hope. These consist of four simulations ran by the derelicts. Malins runs Malwastes, originally the most realistic simulation, until Mal is retreated into his own personal haven to forsake the mission. Mirrod runs Mirrodmore, where she futilely tries to create the mind and spirit of humans. Alphys runs Alphon Domes, the most faithful simulation where environments are still being created and sustained. Finally, BioBeta runs BetaGrid 0.9, where BioBeta is working to recreate a new humanity from the scientific samples sent from Earth. Truthfully, the platforming segments are quite hit or miss. None of them feel particularly interesting or enjoyable. The best level would be BetaGrid 0.9 because it has the best variety of platforming design. It feels very much like a Metroidvania type of map. That said, the opening walkway to the level is extremely tedious to walk through because of its unnecessary length and has nothing but two enemies and a handful of bits to populate it. Alphon Domes isn't particularly bad either, mainly a vertically styled level with four small domes. The level is quick and painless, which is more than can be said for the other levels. Malwaste is just far too basic for its own good. Nothing at all exciting to traverse through, and it's just so painfully bland. Mirrored Moor, however, is the worst offender by far. While the other levels have ranged from acceptable to tolerable, Mirrored Moor is extremely unenjoyable, and rather obtusely designed if you ask me. The simulation consists of a ground level, with multiple openings to submerged areas below. Not only do these areas not link up with each other, but traversing through the water is extremely slow and aggravating. Overall, this level requires more time than the others to finish, and can lead to extended frustration. This also hurts because the Desolate Hope moves between day and night on a world timer, so it's very easy for the player not to get done what they wanted to before night hits, thanks to how slow movement in Mirrored Moor is. Within each simulation are a couple of these red screens. These start the dungeon crawling gameplay segments, where the game takes an old Legend of Zelda top-down style as you travel through rooms to find a fissure in the system. Once again, these segments are rather basic and quite boring. There is no variation in the rooms other than if they have invisible walls or breakable doors, and there are only ever a couple of enemy types to battle with. Not only that, but it's very aggravating the way the bunny rabbit will interrupt his own path to a cabbage patch to instead move towards the one you most recently made. This makes the process of farming bits take even more time. These segments are just very lifeless feeling, and they never really showcase anything substantial. After the day phase ends, the simulations are shut down for the night, and Deco 9 can explore outside the space station for items. Almost all these items are little memento gifts that can be taken back to one of the derelicts to level them up, but there are also bit resources and power cells as well. This segment is one of the more artistic points of the game, as the world and the player are silhouetted against the very beautifully animated vastness of space. There is something that feels majestic and otherworldly about these scenes, and its artistic merit makes them never feel boring as the game goes on. As an extra bonus to players who are quick, if you go outside a fourth time in one night, the items disappear, and you instead stumble across the little space invaders that give you bits when you defeat them.
But what is leveling up the derelicts used for? The final gameplay segment is the JRPG boss battles, where each of the derelicts lends you their power to take down the virus. As much as I've complained that previous gameplay segments are uninspired and lackluster, the JRPG segments make up for it tenfold. These battles are extremely hectic, with a breakneck speed and some gorgeous visuals. Each of the four derelicts feel unique and important to the party for what skills they have to select from. Not only that, but many of the skills are innovative in the way they use keyboard and mouse as a control scheme. Mirrod's ability creates stocks that can be clicked on to be activated by the player whenever he chooses, and each derelict has a minigame that can be played with either the mouse or keyboard at mid-battle for more attribute bonuses. These boss battles are frantic, challenging, beautiful, innovative, and most of all, rewarding. If there is one problem to be had, is that the virus's special attacks are not actually explained, leaving you to deduce on your own what exactly some of them do. Actually, let's hop on that train for a bit. There's a fair amount in the Desolate Hope that is either not explained or poorly explained, and can really rain on the game's enjoyment. Most of the boss attacks are obvious enough as to what they do, but there are definitely some that I still don't know their effect. The platforming segments have three additional bars under your health bar, but it's never explained what these do. Eventually, I figured out that they were attribute bonuses of some degree for the JRPG segments. Two of the minigames within the JRPG section require WASD to use, when the game has only ever used the arrow keys for every other command. Almost all the vendors and their items aren't explained, so you feel like you're risking your hard-earned bits buying something because you don't understand exactly what it does. While some of the items are self-explanatory, some flavor text to the item would have been a massive help. I can see where a lot of this comes from a retro NES style of gameplay, where it's on the player to discover the finer intricacies of what the game has. But because the Desolate Hope has a world timer that can boot you out of the day's phase, and a finite amount of days before Lent Infinite loses power, it instead causes stress. It's not very much fun looking for a hidden vendor inside Miramore for a necessary item when it's possible for the day phase to run out and force you to start the whole level over again. While the gameplay comes out as a mixed bag of very high highs and very low lows, the graphics almost never cease to amaze. It's one thing for Cawthon to design the fantastic world that he has with all of his robotic creativity, but it's another for him to have animated it so brilliantly. Each piece of the Desolate Hope oozes top-notch production value, from the astrological room that houses Mirrod down to the little bouncy coil enemies. One of the best visual areas is the corridor in Lund Infinite that leads to the derelict rooms. The lighting and camera angle of this room is something that could have easily come from one of Ridley Scott's Alien movies. Keep in mind that Scott Cawthon does everything in this game outside of sound effects and music. This level of graphic artistry is astounding for a one-man developer. All of this is doubly so in the JRPG battles. The amount of crisp animation detail and graphical effects are almost too much to handle. It's in this part of the game where the seizure warning comes into effect, as the screen is overloaded with graphical assets. In fact, when one of the bosses casts the spell Hackworm, the screen flickers in and out to disrupt the player's vision. While I feel this could easily trigger a seizure for some, this effect is one of the smartest parts of the game as it contextualizes the mouse and keyboard controls. It's just absolutely brilliant, and I can't sing its praises enough. Sadly, there is one graphical misstep in my opinion. After every boss battle, the virus successfully runs off with one of the simulation's resources. This is visually portrayed as green corruption lines in the platforming sequences. These green lines interrupt one of the game's strongest suits, the graphical beauty, and cause me minor frame rate drops. As always, I understand that I'm not running the best computer, so playing a game and recording it can probably eat up more resources than I'd like, but this was the only part of the game where I experienced this problem. It could have been a deliberate move to further show the decaying state of the simulations. If if that's the case, I think it to be a mistake. The more times you defeat the virus in each level, the heavier the corruption becomes, and thus, the worse looking the game becomes as well. To rob the player of one of the game's best aspects, I feel is a mistake, especially since the platforming sequences are not exactly the most enjoyable things to begin with. I wish the storyline of the Desolate Hope was expanded upon a little more, if only that I really liked the initial concept of its plot. Each of the derelicts has taken their lack of contact from Earth and their extended simulation timeline in a different way. For example, Malin's original simulation was realistic to the point where they were simulated miners mining simulated ore to build simulated cities. But as the decay of age took its course, Malins lost hope in his original mission. He instead retreated to a dome where he created a small happy village in the image of his favorite toys, with himself acting as the village toy maker. I would have loved to have seen cutscenes, either animated or still images, of the rise and fall of some of these simulations. Truthfully, the story does well enough with what it currently has, but I would have just loved to have seen more. The emptiness plays such a big thematic role in the game, and there is really more potential room for expansion, but I can easily take what was given. In the end, I would have to recommend The Desolate Hope. It's kind of hard to recommend because half the game is completely lackluster, but the other half is extremely unique and something I would urge you to experience.
Games with this level of art design will continue to impress as the industry increases the amount of raw graphical power PCs and consoles can pump out, because at the end of the day, no amount of technical superiority can ever trump something with artistic superiority. And let me tell you that The Desolate Hope is artistically superior to many games out there. Between its amazing art design and the innovative JRPG battles, The Desolate Hope is worth experiencing, even if the ride is a little bumpy on the way.